Thank you for uh, opening our eyes. Uh, Bart Stavis, I'd like to uh, give the floor to you first to give us your reaction to the film based on your own practice. Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, you already said thank you, but as someone who has uh, worked kind of within this system, uh, both on the US side and uh, also on the, you know, on the Dutch side, I, um, I want to say thank you. Um, this is, uh, for lawyers, this is also the everyday practice, the reality that we're dealing with yeah. and very often struggling against, fighting against for our clients. And um, I don't think I have, and I've seen, I've watched a lot of documentaries about it, and I don't think I've ever seen someone touch the structural part uh, and, and, and the all-encompassing part of the, uh, the pipeline, which I think is beautifully put and, and, and animated, uh, combined with such a personal story. <laughs> and a personal story, your personal story, but also the personal story of a number of people in the documentary. And I think that's, that's amazing. So I really would like to get together. Thank you. It's a, a, a lot of information, um, a lot to, to take in. Uh, and um, it's such a massive system that sort of, you know, so sort of to cover so much ground was important by partners in America with CNN. And for, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, for me, it's like kind of mass incarceration 101, because I know a lot. But, but for the CNN viewer in America, which is 100 million people, they, um, I got, when it aired on CNN, I got thousands and thousands of emails and, and tweets saying that they had no idea. Most Americans, believe it or not, considering the amount of films there are, I have no idea how the system works and that there is this sort of massive sort of prison industrial complex. So their shock was sort of shocking to me. Yeah. Well, I think it touches on a number of different things. I mean, one of the, 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 the questions you keep asking is really kind of like, hey, how, does, how does this happen, right? And, um, uh, uh, I, I think there are a few wonderful uh, uh, comments that show a lot, like in America, everything is about race. You know, I think that's very, very well put by a uh, person who said that. Uh, and can, I think can, that's, you, can you relate this to your own practice in those years that you had a community law center in New Orleans? Yeah, I set up, uh, and maybe it's a little bit of a background, I did a lot of death penalty work, and I saw that race and poverty were the red threads through the uh, through the death penalty, not because uh, uh, black people or poor people commit more crimes, but because of the way the system uh, punishes differently. Uh, and, and, and there's plenty of research actually demonstrating that racism in every piece of the uh, death penalty system, every, every step of the way, from the moment the crime gets committed through the, 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 the way it's being actually handled. Um, and so I, I saw that and I wanted to uh, do something more proactively. So I set up a community law center in a public housing project in New Orleans. Um, and I tried to, and, and, and it worked, but I mean, uh, I, I, I thought, well, this is a good place for me to, to do a community law center, to, do, to practice law. I was uh, at last, last year law school. And some of my greatest mentors said, well, you know, maybe you should ask the community first whether they want you in there as a lawyer. As a white guy. As a white guy, exactly. And um, um, so, so we did. And um, this was a very uh, uh, organized community with a strong resident council and a strong organization called Black Men United for Change. And they became the board of my organization and they set the priorities. Basically, from the very simple concept that if you're trying to help people, uh, then maybe these people should have a say in how you're trying to help them. <laughs> you know, it is a very, you know, very, very simple. And 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 so that's 
what we try to do. And uh, in that community, I have an office in the community, um, we're 750 families. And I don't think I have ever in that community met a young black man who had not been stopped by the police. Who, uh, and, and I've heard so many of these stories. And some of it is so subtle in a way that if you don't see it or if you're not, if you don't live it, it's like, really? Like, it's the simple thing of being called to the police car. You know, you come over here, show your ID, be frisked. You without know, having done anything. Without having done anything. And then you can get on, go on your way. You're not always arrested. But what that does in terms of your mindset, in terms of your interactions with, with, with police, with authorities, and the expectations that society somehow sends to you, it's like, you're a criminal. You're, you're basically getting that message reinforced. Being prejudged. Yeah, exactly. Like being so, being he, black people walking down the street. Exactly. Yes, yes. Traveling while black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you know, when I see a police officer, my heart starts racing. My, I get sweaty. I'm like so nervous because I'm, there is a huge possibility that they're going to stop me. And I've been stopped many times um, driving in my car because I have a house in the country and I have a, a, a decent car. And they stop me and they're like, whose car is this? Where are you going? Um, what are you doing here? You know, I'm the, the sort of, I'm one of the only black people in this whole town that I live in upstate New York. Um, so it's, it's, I don't think people understand how common it is, how and how, why we're so terrified of the police. And then now you, there's so many, um, so, there's so much, because of cell phones, there's so much footage and so many viral videos. Um, I just did a VR project called Traveling While Black um, with Oculus, um, where you can really be embedded and experience what it's like to be a black person in, um, in America traveling and, and throughout sort of starting in the past throughout history starting in like the, the, end, the 50s the late 50s and, and early 60s through now that not much has changed mm -hmm. so before the passage of the Civil Rights Act until now not much has changed in America mm -hmm. for, black, mm -hmm. for black men. Mm -hmm. Um, or can you react to the uh, bit of footage in this movie about the situation in the Netherlands? 3,000 empty cells. Uh, uh, it's so unbelievably different. And I really was touched by your reaction, Roger, when you said, oh, it looks so nice here. <laughs> Which probably was the inmates here don't think, but comparatively speaking. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's kind of, uh, I think it's, it's true. I mean, it, 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 comparatively, comparatively speaking, uh, it, it's a huge difference. Uh, there, there's, there's no doubt about that. And, and yet, if you look at it from a simply Dutch perspective, we have also moved in the last you know, 20, 30 years towards a uh, more, a, more incapacitation, basically, basically putting people away for, for a certain period of time, and especially in terms of the prison conditions. There has been a tremendous sobering over time already. Uh, uh, people are locked up. You know, certainly from 4:30 in the afternoon to, to the next day, because there's no personnel. Uh, so there is, there is. There, while it's comparatively speaking definitely a good system, there are some great things. There's someone in the audience who runs a, a yoga project in, uh, in 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 prison. There are those kind of initiatives uh, that are uh, uh, that are there that are welcomed in certain in certain ways. But we have also moved a little bit in the wrong direction over time. So the total um, glorification is not quite in order anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it was, it was, well, it was shocking to me when I, um, after spending so much time in prisons in America, and the, the absolutely brutally harsh conditions yeah. from the food to, I mean, everything, maggots in the food to the living conditions was just shocking. And then I go to the Dutch yeah, prison, no, and they have their own nice bath, separate bathrooms, yeah. and they're, and it's like, you know, and just the, the sort of the way, the attitude towards the prisoners, and sort of sitting in the library there, and like, it was just, um, 
uh, shocking to me, but, and I also, what's not in the film is I went to um, a prison in the Netherlands that, um, because there's so many prison cells, they actually house prisoners from other countries, so I went to a prison that had prisoners from Norway. Norway yeah. yeah, I went to that prison, and that was really, really amazing, because the prisoners made their own meals, they had knives, and they were chopping vegetables, yeah. and cooking their own steaks, and they had a garden and they were gardening. And when I got to the prison, they were, um, there was a, a volleyball, a beach volley, they have a beach volleyball um, court. And they had, there was just a beach volleyball match between the guards and the prisoners. And, they, and, no one, and there's no guns in the prison. The guards don't carry guns and they don't have guns. And they were like, well, why do we need guns? Why would we have an adversarial relationship where we would need guns? And the, and the prisoners, you know, were, so, especially the prisoners from Norway, a lot, they were so happy. They were like, we're here. I mean, that, you know, I don't, and they didn't like, they didn't curate, they didn't say you can only talk to these, they, they gave me free reign. I could walk around the prison, go into any cell, talk to whatever prisoners, they, they, they were like all running around in the kitchen, watch them cooking. The knives are on chains, so they can't take them with them, but they're, they're using these giant knives. So it's, it was insane to me. I was like, wow, this is incredible. Well, there's, there's one thing I want to say, because it, I think what, what that says, and that, that's definitely something that I've, uh, I've always struggled with in the, in the U.S. prison system, the jail system, the dehumanization. And the dehumanization starts basically from the moment you get in there, because you, you lose your own clothes. So you're forced to wear a prison guard. And that in itself, although, you know, you'd say, well, that's a small step. No, it's the, it's the first step in the, in the gradual process of further and further and further dehumanization. And, and, and that's definitely something that is totally different in, in, in the Netherlands. You have people in prison where they're unclosed. There is a sense of, there's much more of a sense of humanity. And I, I love the fact that really that you took the bathroom example, because to me too, that is, it is about dignity. It is about, you know, and it is senseless to, you know, have the bathroom in the middle of a room where there are eight beds. It is, just doesn't make any sense. Well, it's degrading. Exactly, except for to dehumanize and to basically put you in your place. Yeah. And, and that part, I, I, I love the way you yeah. demonstrate. Yeah. Before think, we go to the audience, I'd like to ask you one thing, but um, could we have the lights up in the hall? There will be opportunities for questions. There's a microphone. Um, That's better, I didn't see it. Yeah, I didn't so see it. So yeah. Yeah. There's also a, a handheld, Mika has the handheld, and we also have the interruption microphone here in the hall. But I wanted to ask you one thing first, Roger, that amazed me. For example, this talk with these three women about the uh, $545 that you're, I mean, how much more does it cost to incarcerate this woman than to let her pay her minuscule debt? I was amazed that you were able to speak to these people so freely. In, yes. America, in an well, American prison. Yeah. So the reason the reason that happened is because um, in my hometown, uh, like I'm well known in that town because um, after winning the Oscar, they had a ticker tape parade. They had the mayor, everyone. They gave me the key to the city. Oh. The governor of Pennsylvania came out, and I mean, and so I used that capital to say, I want to get inside the prison, I want the mayor and the senator, Senator Casey from Pennsylvania, or, or he was the senator, to let me have access to the prison, and they gave me complete free reign. And I also got the um, head of um, incarcerations for the entire state of Pennsylvania, who has a system bigger than the whole country of the Netherlands. He has more people incarcerated in Pennsylvania than are in, in the whole system, prison system here. To um, uh, who is actually quite progressive, and, he, and he's quite progressive because he came to the Netherlands and saw the prison. He took a tour um, and through the Netherlands prison system, and it changed the way he sort of saw his what he was doing in Pennsylvania. And because of that, and, I, and he did a TED talk about it, and because of that, I contacted him, went and met with him. He's an African American man, and he's like. It is a disaster. And he goes, probably talking to you is going to get me fired. But he also let it gave me, it didn't, did not get him fired as, as of yet. Um, <laughs> but he gave me, they gave me complete rain, which was, um, which was un, sort of unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to use your capital where you know. Oh, sure. to do good. <laughs> use your tools when you go to work. Well, there's, there's one thing that, that I think is so ironic to bring it back to the, the, the daily re reality now is, 
you know, when you watch the Kavanaugh hearings last week, and, and we're talking about, you know, one of the, the examples that Adam call, uh, uh, asked the audience in his TED talk, like how many of you have been drinking while underage? We, we, we now are going to have a Supreme Court justice who basically lied to Congress about drinking underage. And you know, I don't care about the drinking underage part so much, but about the fact that this is someone who had a number of clear youthful problems and also has been charged uh, uh, with a sexual assault in, in his juvenile years. And if you compare that with so many of the stories in your, in your documentary, and, 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 and here, this guy's gonna be confirmed to the Supreme Court, what does that say in a way about, about the country at that part that worries me? I, 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 I love the US, I love, I love working there, but that punitive nature and the, 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 the racism that runs through the whole system uh, is, um, is, is, is also, you mentioned at one point, there's no real light, you know, uh, no, no real light at the end of the tunnel here. And I think it is, it's, it's very, very disheartening. Yeah. Yeah. The police are not in those frat houses and in the suburban exactly. white communities exactly. where those guys are drinking and doing drugs. Um, they are in uh, black communities and communities of color and focused on those people and those pe and people in those communities do not have a have a chance the way a privileged person like Brett Kavanaugh and it's just it's a, it's you know that's the reality of America and Trump has turned back the clock on mass incarceration that Obama was really and Eric Holder were really pushing for reforms and really um, that was one of his missions to reform the criminal justice system and now it is completely reversed um, and it is we are heading into even darker times. So, you know, I'm, I'm having an event um, a couple of weeks for um, a guy running for Congress in my district. It's the, all about midterm elections for us. So we hope, hopefully that's going to change things. But it's a dark time for, especially for criminal justice. Mm -hmm. The word is for the audience. Could we have the lights, please? Oh, we have a disco. Oh, but they don't have that at Jim. Your questions? Uh, we good? Hi. Over here, gentlemen over here, and then this lady. Uh, and you can have a little bit more light. Could we have some more light, please? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. We, we can hardly see you. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe better. <laughs> okay, you mentioned in the film that uh, corporations like Starbucks and there was at least one other uh, are, are exorbitantly profiting from, uh, from the system. In, in what way can you elucidate that? Yeah, so they um, can, they employ prisoners to, um, you know, make their product, basically, to, uh, um, you know, it, it's, you don't know, because uh, a lot of this work that, um, it's through sub, subcontractors. So Starbucks will um, engage a contractor who will engage a subcontractor to make whatever coffee cups or whatever in prisons. And so it's hard to, to trace it. Um, Prison Legal News, um, this feature in the film, did a um, study. So there's a lot of companies, um, Victoria's Secret, Starbucks, uh, there's a lot of companies that are um, making a huge profit, but it's really hard to trace. And also people don't really care. People are like, oh, well, they're in prison. They should, they should, be, they should work for little to no money. But families, their families, they still have families to support. These, these um, people who are incarcerated still have children, and um, and they have to, and, and the, they, without that income, those families are suffering. So it affects whole communities. Um, and these corporations are getting labor for little to nothing. And there are certain states where they can, where they have to work completely. For I was struck by the irony of uh, one of these companies being Victoria's Secret, 
sexy women's <laughs> lingerie yes. uh, that these men are, are making when they're uh, completely cut off from any sort of normal human contact, yeah. sex yeah. life, intimacy. That seemed particularly cool to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's no way knowing exactly um, all the companies that are profiting, um, but there is a, um, and also they don't, they keep those programs, it was hard to even get to see some of those programs because they keep them really, really secret. They really don't want you to know. It's super embarrassing to a corporation, especially a progressive company like Starbucks, which based its whole identity on being, you know, progressive. Um, to and you know, Starbucks had what would they do? Like I think it was last year they had all their baristas write race on the on the cups. You know, there's a company that they want to be sort of confronting race and the, the race problem in America, but they're profiting off of it. We had a question. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Could you pull the microphone towards you so we can hear you better? Yeah, thanks. I wanted to ask you about alternative sentencing. Um, when I went to law school a long time ago, it was something that I saw in courts in Massachusetts and New York, and it was the beginning. I was wondering whether it's blossomed since then or if you saw it. Um, yeah. Pennsylvania or Louisiana? Yeah, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll say it's the first one. That, I mean, there are definitely some initiatives. Uh, uh, one initiative that has, uh, I think, yeah, really taken a, taken a, uh, has, has grown a lot are the initiative of drug courts. So basically it is a, uh, yeah, a setting where you show up in court every week and a judge, and it usually are the judges that are you know, not, not as punitive as some others. Uh, um, uh, talk to the, to to the people in the program about th their progress in terms of jobs, in terms of um, uh, education, and then they're drug tested every week. I I I personally I like those programs because they're better than jails, but there's still a very punitive aspect to it. You know, it's it's still a judge. It's still a, a in a way like you do this or or else. Um, I think a lot of other more alternative sentencing <laughs> setups have uh, really, in, in, uh, over time, dis you know, dis disappeared or have, have not grown. Certainly, there are pockets in, in the US where these initiatives are, are, are used, uh, but it's small and it's not at a, at a, state, at a state level or a federal level. Um, there's been a, uh, the sentencing guidelines have been adjusted under Holder, um, and, and that has led to the release of a, a great number of non-violent drug users. Uh, and so that was, that was progress. But um, the real issue to me is almost what's, what's behind people getting in trouble uh, and how do you deal with that piece. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, there is, is very, very little uh, uh, attention for that. And that has certainly not you know, uh, uh, increased enough. For prevention. For prevention and, yeah, for, for, well, prevention and early intervention. You mentioned the early intervention at one point. Early intervention, because that's really, in a way, what's, what's often necessary. If someone gets in their first trouble, okay, then you can choose the punitive track. You can say, okay, well, we put, we put you away, or we put, even for a few days, we put you in the, in the, in the lockup. Or we say, well, what's really going on here? And, and there are some great, uh, there's, there is, um, in New York, there is the uh, uh, Brooklyn Defenders. Uh, there are some, some great places where they do holistic lawyering, where they do a holistic approach and say, okay, what's really going on here? Why is this kid getting in trouble? Well, what's, what's going on in the house? Uh, what's going on with the parenting? What's going on with immigration status, which is a huge issue? Uh, what's going on with employment? Well, you can't just pick one thing out and say, oh, he's a bad boy. Put him away. No, you've got to do that in a, in a more holistic perspective, and, and that's you know there's there's some things going on with that, but not not enough. No, I mean I think you know there's there was a uh, there's a growing um, industry, another industry called the, they called the treatment industrial complex, hmm. which is um, people sort of you know not really coming up with people profiting off of. Um, the, the idea of, of treatment um, of, of 
people who are you know, addicted to substances, but also um, not with any real sort of success. It's sort of it's become another industry. And there's a you can um, I think that uh, there's a lot of connections between um, sort of you know sort of this big business and and how to how to make money off of that. So it's all about, you know it's always about money. Pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? Um, I have a lot of thoughts in my head, so I'm sorry if this comes out a little bit jumbled, but I lived here for 14 years, and I also am the chair of Democrats Abroad in Netherlands, so if you need to register to vote, come see me afterwards. Um, that being said, something that's really important to me is the idea of community in this country. I've lived here for 14 years, and I think one of the reasons why um, the prisons are closing is because there's an idea of community to take care of people, to give people help instead of incarcerate them. And that's led to less drug use, less drug crime, everything that we associate with that. So my question is, how do we solve this in the US? Do we focus on legislative? Do we focus on building community? Do we focus on teaching people empathy to care about people even though they made a mistake? Like where do we even begin? And do you have any ideas? I think it's all of the above. I think it has to be community initiatives. It's everything is local. So it's about it's about local law enforcement. It's about local whether it's local churches. It's about it's a definitely local. Is, is where you start with initiatives, and um, you know and uh, you know but also electing uh, people who actually care and about the prison criminal justice system. I think that's a, there's big efforts. There's, there's, there is positive, you know, there's a big effort. Um, someone just contacted me, um, Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy, who was a huge force in uh, criminal justice in America. Uh, just, there was a movie just made about him. Michael P. Jordan is uh, playing, uh, is starring in the, in the film Just Mercy. And there's a 50 million, a bunch of funders have raised $50 million initiative around the movie, around outreach and engagement. And they want to do a series of documentaries and films. And so there's, there are people working towards the, towards, you know, upcoming solution. We're right now battling a tough administration and, and a tough justice department, but uh, there's, there's hope. I think the voting part is, is, is absolutely crucial. I mean, I, I think all these initiatives are so important, but, um, you know, if you just uh, uh, look at the, at the past eight years, the, 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 the progress that has been, has been made on uh, criminal justice reform, and there was even some bipartisan support, even the Coe brothers started piece, uh, supported pieces of the criminal justice reform. So there is some, some way to get out of this. Uh, it does take some political pressure, and it does take some people to take the lead. And uh, Holder was willing to take some of the lead, in, 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 in Obama himself. Obama was the first city president to ever visit, visit a prison. And it was a small visit, it was orchestrated. If you look at the, the scenes, he's like, oh, well, well, yeah, it's a little bit uh, for the show. But at the same time, the symbolic value of a president actually sitting down with prisoners and listening to them and talking about what it's like and you know how they look at their situation to me was was very moving and and it, so that's an important piece that the, 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 the has to be democratic reform so that it can be on the agenda uh, and, and can stay on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. And and you Ben, you're working on something now called the Innocence Project. Yes. Ten part series. Ten part series for Netflix. Um, the Innocence Project is a. I don't know how many years has the Innocence Project. Uh, uh, well, there are different pieces, but the, the, you working with Peter and, and Barry Schiff. What is the Innocence Project? Okay, the Innocence. You know, you're making. You know, you're, you're making you know I'm just talking. You know more about this. You've done more work with this. Mark can tell us what it is, and then you can tell us what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> Well, the Innocent Project, uh, it, it's funny, it started in part a little bit with the, uh, the growth of DNA evidence in, in, uh, in, in criminal trials. And then it became more obvious, it was always obvious somewhat, but it became more obvious that a lot of people had been convicted uh, while they were not guilty of the crime. And uh, actually really not guilty, like someone else did it, they were not around. Uh, not like, well, it was manslaughter instead of murder. No, it's like someone else did it entirely. Did it. And um, 
So that started uh, uh, an initiative basically to take on these cases of innocence and to uh, apply for the release of the physical evidence, forensic evidence, get it retested, apply modern DNA, uh, uh, modernized DNA uh, sam uh, sampling to it, uh, uh, testing to it. And so that- Were these cold cases for it? Were they long ago or were they recent? No, they a mix, a mix, some, some very, very long ago, some more recent, yeah. And so Barashek and Peter Neufeld were uh, some of the people that started this as almost like a, like a project, and then it, it skyrocketed. There are innocent projects in, I think, pretty much every state. Uh, they've done amazing work in, in the sense that you know, a lot of it, it's also uh, uh, frightening almost to, to realize how many innocent people were convicted serving life sentences. I've done death penalty work. People have been executed. Can really, you know, undo those consequences anymore. But it's it's frightening. So it's great that you're doing so. Now you can say what you're doing. About yeah, that. I mean, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of these, a lot, not all, but a lot of the people who were wrongfully convicted were um, are because of race, yeah. because they were poor and black. Um, uh, I'm focusing on uh, Mississippi, on a community uh, in Mississippi. Uh, uh, three uh, wrongfully convicted men who spent uh, 18, uh, 30 years, one spent 18 years, one spent 30 years, um, half that time in solitary confinement, uh, uh, and, and, um, and a third one who spent uh, like around 20, 25 years in prison, and uh, they didn't, didn't do it. And the guy who they, they found, the guy who actually did it, he confessed, uh, who was a white guy, not a black guy. These are, they're now elderly black men from very poor communities, and they went to a prison, it's called Parchment Prison, which is a uh, plantation. Um, and they uh, pick cotton, and so they 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 are the guards are on horseback and they're in a chain gang and they wear stripes. It's like out of the movie. Like it you sounds wouldn't, familiar. You wouldn't believe it still happens today in America. And they are um, uh, picking. They they just ended the cotton picking program just last year, um, but they are they do labor out in the fields and um, and. And uh, the, these guys that I'm focusing on, were, um, two of them have um, got, been released. They were all, all three on death row. Uh, one of them um, got released. He's an incredible person. We just did an interview with him um, last year. He's an artist and a sculptor and just the most loving man. And to consider he spent 30 years in prison and 15 years in solitary confinement, he's has, it's um, unbelievable how he's not bitter about it and how he's embracing the life that he had and then he recently just died of cancer. So I interviewed him right before he died. The third guy is about to be get out, um, uh, Barry Peter, so we're gonna sort of follow him as he gets off death row and, and let out of prison and reunited with his family. It's gonna be obviously really emotional, but there are just tons of stories like this. They've, they've gotten hundreds, hundreds mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. out of, um, who were wrongfully convicted. Um, and uh, uh, so it's going to be a very emotional uh, journey. And um, I'm sort of one of the things I'm focusing on are um, bite marks, uh, the sort of sort of junk science where they use these dentists. The guy um, in the in the, the prosecutor in, that I'm focusing on in this community, he is a his grandfather's. <coughs> Confederate statue sits in front of the Confederate courthouse. He's put away more black men in his community. He reads from the Bible in his opening and closing arguments. He is notorious, and he's still at it. And uh, I'm focusing on him and the dentist that he works with, who uses, he presses a, like a, a bite, like a, like teeth into uh, into the um, into the body and says these are the bite this is this bite mark matches it's total like fake science to, in order to convict these guys it's a it's a total racket and they make a fortune doing it the dentist the the the, the coroner the prosecutor they're all in business together to just put away black men it's like a factory and this is going to send them to prison to pick up maybe maybe I can I can it's one one thing. Uh, from my perspective, is is uh, you know because you would say, well, wait a minute, there's something missing in this system. There's supposed to be a, a defense lawyer somewhere mm -hmm. pushing back. Yeah. 
right? And, and, and that's uh, another piece, and that's also a, a reason why people um, get uh, wrongly convicted, simply because um, there is no payment, no significant payment for defense attorneys. The public defenders who handle a lot of the smaller cases are pretty much constantly overburdened. They have sometimes four, four, more than 400 cases, handling more, four, more than 400 cases. You cannot possibly handle more than 400 cases in New and well. So the, 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 the way the system, certainly the American system, which I love in theory, is set up, you have two sides that really are equal in some ways. The adversarial system, you can both work your case and the jury or the judge can, can decide. Well, but if one side is significantly underfunded and structurally underfunded and doesn't really play the game well, then you know that side just doesn't play along. I mean, it doesn't get hurt, yeah. and so the other side uh, wins. But that's basically what it's like. Your question. Hello. Uh, thank you, Roger, so much for your powerful film. Um, I do a question. Um, I work at Greaterford Maximum Security Prison in Pennsylvania. I uh, filmed there. Yeah. I know, I saw some pictures. <laughs> um, but I try, I came to the Netherlands to be a teacher, and I try to teach my students about my experience at Greaterford. And a lot of Dutch students and my colleagues tell me that, well, in the Netherlands, it's a hotel. It's really nice to be here. Like, they don't learn anything. It's not a punishment. But I don't agree. But what do I say to these students and colleagues that are Dutch who don't believe that their system actually does help, especially if they haven't seen your film? What do I say to them when I say, well, the American system is not something you want to go towards. This is not mass incarceration the way we do it does not work. Your system at least works a little bit better. Uh, well, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, in order to have a real good discussion, I think, about what works and what doesn't work, uh, you need to have an, an, an understanding of why people end up committing a crime. And that's a very difficult analysis sometimes. Uh, uh, that that that's, that's, has something to do with age, has something to do with circumstances, has something to do with opportunity. And so the real answer, I would say, is it's just not that simple, you know? People people want to have simple answers. So lock them up is a very simple answer to say, well, then at least we don't have to worry about it anymore. If you want to have, a, unfortunately, I think this goes for a lot of public policy, if you want to have a real thought out, good, effective way of dealing with crime, you, you got to do a, a number of different strategies. Uh, uh, and uh, education is a big piece of it, employment is a big piece of it, giving opportunities is a big piece of it. Uh, and, uh, but also mental health issues, substance abuse issues. So you got to look at the person and, 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 and see what is, what's going wrong here. And that's the only way you're going to correct that person. You know, it's called the Department of Corrections. Well, there's very little correction going on. Uh, it's, it's called a penitentiary. The idea was to go outside of the society to, to, to have penitence, to, to repent in a sense, to sit back and say, well, what have I done wrong? Well, there is no way you're going to uh, uh, sit back in any of these prisons and, and, and even have any uh, 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 quiet time to think. Uh, so I think that the, the answer what I also give to Dutch students is, is it, and American students also, you have to just think this through. There are no simple answers. It's a complicated issue why people commit crimes. Certainly when we're dealing with uh, very, very violent crimes, you know, when you were dealing with death penalty cases, people that have really committed gruesome, gruesome crimes. That just doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's not a conscious decision. I get up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to kill somebody today. It's a mix, it's a combustion. And unfortunately, we all have, in a society, we have to look at that combustion. We have to struggle with it and say, where can we, where can we do something? No simple answers. No simple answers. Yeah. I have a million more questions, and I think the audience does too. Um, Just one person has my Yes, we have two more minutes, so we'll do your question. Yes. Thanking you for your persistence, and then I'll make some closing remarks, and then we'll go have a beer and, uh, and uh, okay. talk to Roger. Talk to Roger. <laughs> <laughs> the whole film, you mentioned black and poor people. What about the other side of the criminals, the white and real real criminal ones, the ones that the CEOs and the corrupted judges, did you also thought about going there 
that's also jail, so close to me. So to think about going there and also for comparison. What, what do you mean by there? Going jail, to where? where they go to the jail, you mean like, their jail. You mean like federal, um, like the whatever, yeah, the, yeah, like yeah. Where, where Martha Stewart went? The yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Those oh, no. so, I wonder if they do community like making Victoria's Secrets. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, we could have Martha Stewart got to do the Victoria's Secret, um, but um, she'd probably be good at it. Um, no, I mean, for me, you know, this was about my own experience as a as a connected to, to this one, to the uh, uh, extension of the final question. Can you uh, formulate it yeah. in, uh, in one sentence? One sentence well, uh, <laughs> what prison does a person like Paul Manafort go to now? I understand that he is in prison. Where would he be? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, because you have a lot of different, uh, different prisons. You have the, the big state prisons like Parchment or Angola. Uh, that are former plantations uh, that are where, where uh, th th those are not the type of prisons where Paul Manafort or other or white collar criminals go to. They are going to, uh, they're always in the federal system. The federal uh, prisons by and large are a lot better, although part of the federal prisons are also uh, uh, contracted out to, uh, uh, to private uh, companies and they, they don't do well. But uh, no, they, they, they're called camps and the camps, uh, uh, well, I've, I've been to a number of camps, and there's uh, one of the camps in Pennsylvania, actually, in uh, uh, Western Pennsylvania. There's a nice uh, uh, picture on the wall, like, people come here uh, as punishment, not for punishment. And, you know, like, almost similar to what the Dutch uh, representative said. Uh, so there's a tennis court, uh, there's a little bit more, yeah, freedom to roam around, there is a good library. Uh, uh, no maggots in the food. There's no maggots. There no maggots in the food. So it's a different. There, within the prison system, there's also a huge difference, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it's tied to race as well. You, yeah. can't, you can't hide it. I have friends whose parents, father went. A friend whose father went to a um, for you know white collar crime, and made business dealings and came out richer from being in prison than he did, did going in because you're there with a lot of you know yeah. guys who you can make you know deals with um, who are also white collar criminals who have power and, and privilege. It's so a network. it's a network in, in the prisons, in those, in those prisons. But you know the majority of people in prison, the, 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 the fifty percent of the prisons that are that are that have African American. Um, in, in there, and the majority of prisons are and Latino, uh, and Latino, and, 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 yeah, it's just a grim, it's not like that at all. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of people. Well, before we say goodbye to our guests for this evening, before we go for a beer, I wanted to tell you that Roger is going to be live on Badwolf this weekend on Sunday at noon. And uh, it might be interesting to tune in and uh, see what he adds to the discussion here. And um, for other interesting events coming up with the John Adams soon, October 18th, Jonathan Capehart, who is a political commentator, a Washington insider, also black, also gay. I love Jonathan Capehart, it's amazing. Come back, yes. October 18th. <laughs> He's at the John Adams. November 4th, the novelist Richard Powers. November 13th, the historian Timothy Snyder. If you don't know Snyder, you might come across him if you go to see the new film by Michael Moore. Timothy Snyder is one of the people he interviews, and he has some really sharp observations. November 30th, Christiana Amanpour, the queen of CNN. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I've done her show. She's young for it's amazing. She's also 60 Minutes in America, which is the most highly rated show in America. Yeah. And she's coming specially to the John Adams. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And December 11th, Michael Pollan. And Michael Pollan's new book is not about food, but about psychedelics. He has tried everything. He's going to tell us all about it. So, thank you for joining us this evening. Come back soon. Do us a favor and bring a friend. Tell your friends about all the cool stuff that we do here. And may I have a great round of applause for Roger.